Hey guys, this is Chelsea. And before we get into this week's episode of the Financial Confessions with Kimberly Foster, founder of For Harriet, I wanted to give you guys a quick heads up on the audio for this episode. When we were filming with Kimberly out in LA, we ran into a few hiccups with our mic setup and didn't realize until we got back and started editing. So the audio is gonna be a little bit different in this episode, but in our opinion, the content is just as good as always, if not better. So stay tuned and listen to my episode with Kimberly Foster of For Harriet. Hello everyone, it is Chelsea Fagan and I am back with another episode of the Financial Confessions with, surprise, surprise, a very exciting guest that you guys have been really excited about. But before I introduce you guys to her, I'd like to introduce you guys to our beloved sponsor with whom we make every episode of the Financial Confessions. So as you guys know, we make every episode of the Financial Confessions in partnership with Intuit, who are the makers of so many amazing financial tools and apps and programs that help you live a better financial life, things like TurboTax, Mint, Turbo, etc. cetera. Uh, basically, if you have something in your life financially that you are wanting to do, a goal you're trying to reach, something that's a little bit difficult for you, they give you the tools that help you do that in a way that's easy and fun and intuitive. Every day here at TFD, actually, I use one of their amazing programs, QuickBooks, to manage all of TFD's finances. And when I tell you that it completely changed my life as a business owner, I am not exaggerating because I used to do my actual like accounting for the company on pieces of paper, which was unhinged looking back and also impossible to keep straight. And now with QuickBooks, every morning when I log in, there's just this beautiful little dashboard that gives me all of the information that I need about the general financial health of my company, all of the invoices, you know, the payments, uh, you know, the money we have coming in, our expenses, everything we need to know. And it syncs up effortlessly with our accountants who help us with our bookkeeping. But that's just one of the amazing products that Intuit makes. So I highly recommend you check out QuickBooks and all the rest down at the link in our description and the show notes. So as promised, exciting guest. We have someone that I have been watching on YouTube for a very long time. I actually, like, as of two days ago, watched her video on Jordan Woods and the Kardashians, which I know makes me <laughs> extremely late on cultural events, but whatever. It's I, I, I get to it when I get to it. Um, she is an author, a YouTuber, the founder of For Harriet, which is a website and a YouTube channel and media company. Her name is Kim Foster. Hi. Hello. <laughs> Thank you for having me. And also, I admire you for just catching up on the Jordan Woods drama. Oh my God. <laughs> well, it's so funny because, so I really, like, I watch your videos in some ways, so I'm like very out of touch with a lot of things. And I feel like when you're because you cover I feel like you're very good at picking the things that you cover and so I feel like if you've got a video on it it's worth listening to it's worth learning about honestly I just there's certain kinds of trash that I like oh, you know, I'm, I'm not into <laughs> all of the trash but when something catches my eye I have to go I have to go in on it give us for those who may not have watched uh give us your take on the Jordan Woods Kardashian thing okay <laughs> <laughs> this is so trashy. Okay, so um, Jordan Woods used to be best friends with Kylie Jenner, and they were right. best friends for years, like from like middle school, maybe even like late elementary school, all the way through high school, and they both became like these big like social media presences. Okay, and so um, a couple a year ago, um, when was that video made? Last year, a while ago. There, there was a big friend breakup because. Yes. Jordan Woods was out with Khloe Kardashian's baby daddy one night, and she says that he kissed her, and he says it was consensual, mutual on both sides, mm. but that created a big scandal, right? Right. And so then Kylie is in the middle because Kylie is, like, really, really close with Khloe, and so Jordan becomes like the scapegoat and all of the Kardashian, the Kardashian Jenners, they descend down on her, like, you're bad, how could you do this? You betrayed us. And so I was just like, I mean, it wasn't the coolest thing to do. Right. But the Kardashian Jenners, like, their whole thing is stealing people's men. That's you true. Do that. that is true. You reap what you sow. Yes. Don't cry girl code now. Yes. When years and years and years we've seen you take this girl's man, this girl's, it's like, that's your thing. 
That's okay. yeah. Isn't that the whole like plot line of Amber Rose, Kim Kardashian, Amber Rose, and Kanye? Kim Kardashian, Khloe Kardashian got with the father of her daughter while he was with somebody else. Um, it's like oh y'all keep doing this. And yes. also like Kylie and Tyga. This is so. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. Okay, but it's like. <laughs> Okay, so Kylie got with Tyga when Tyga was still with Black China, and Black right. China used to be really good friends with Kim Kardashian. So they were right. all hanging out like in a friend group, and then Tyga is the older one. I'm gonna say he was the aggressor because he was an adult. Yeah, wasn't she underage? Yeah. Ooh. Right. <laughs> and so like he like eyes Kylie, and then they get together. But the other thing about it is Kim was not a teenager. Like right. Kim could have been like, "What's going on?" But like, right. she didn't. No. Like, you condone this. That's your, you, like you said, you reap what you sow. Yeah. Yeah. I find it so, it's so fascinating, like, their role, the Kardashians' role in our culture, because I feel like I'm constantly hearing hot takes about how, like, the Kardashians are feminist icons. No. no. And I'm like, ooh, we really got to raise our standards for what we consider a feminist icon. But I do feel like we have a hard time as a culture separating out women who are financially successful yeah. and women who are feminist. Yeah. Like, one does not equate to the other. But that's, like, the lean-in feminism, right? right? Where it's, like, for some people, their ultimate feminist goal is to get as much as men have, do exactly what men do. We want to be operating in the same exact playing fields in the same arenas as men. Right. And if we can do that and still be sexual and be unclothed and be moms, it's like, that's that is what they are aspiring to. Right. I don't think that that equates for liberation for most women. I don't necessarily think that amassing lots and lots of wealth, hoarding as much wealth as you can, I don't think that that should be what we aspire to. That shouldn't be what we put on a pedestal. But for some women, that's it. Um, I have lots of critiques of that. So if that is your realm of what you think feminism is, then like, yeah, like Kim Kardashian is doing it. But like, does that trickle down? I, I, I would argue it doesn't, and I would also say, and I think this is like maybe a more controversial one, but I feel like their image of what women are, of who women are, what, what a woman is supposed to be, is so heavily crafted in the male gaze. Yeah. And so heavily crafted in, um, I mean, when you look at photo, I mean, for example, like you look at Kylie Jenner. You know, that that girl had completely remade yeah. herself physically before she even finished puberty. Yeah. You know, and I look at that and I think I understand where on some really narrow view of feminism that is all about like having complete, you know, and total control over mm -hmm. yourself. That could be seen as like a really extreme form of agency. But like, who does that very specific look appeal to? I think this this stuff is so it's so complicated and it's so tricky because it's like if you're a woman, do I want you to be able to choose what you want for yourself? Right. So if you feel the best being super made up or getting body modifications right. or changing the shape of your face, if that's what makes you feel the best in the world and powerful and empowered and confident, do I want to strip that away from you? I don't. Mm -hmm. I do think that we need to question why, right? Like. So we know that this ideal is um, what works best for women in the world. Like we, women, if you embody yourself a certain way, that means that you're gonna have access to more opportunities, um, you know, get what you want from men, get what you want in the world. Um, you can monetize it, it's profitable. Um, but also like attention, right? Like attention is a new form of totally. currency in totally. our world. If that's what you want, like I get why you would want that. And also I understand that for some women, that is their only way out. Right. You know, right. like, I'm a privileged-ass woman, okay? So I don't necessarily have to go that route to be able to live a financially stable life. So I understand that, like, I get it. But we should be questioning, like, why is that the only option? Right. Why, for so many people, is that the only way to find a certain amount of success or financial stability or access or opportunity? And if we're not questioning it, then then our feminism is shallow because right. there are always going to be women who don't, who can't get the body modifications, right. who can't embody themselves in that hyper feminine way. Right. And so if this is a project to liberate all women, no matter where you are on the totem pole, that can't be the only ideal that works. Because ultimately too, like that, 
access to that comes down to money yeah. for the most part. I mean, yes, there are certain things that most income levels mm -hmm. can access, but if you're talking about like the kind of changes that a Kardashian or an Instagram model, or, mm -hmm. you know, even really to this point, like a, just a famous woman, the kinds of body modifications that they're doing, ultimately that's just tens, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars. Right. I mean, it's, it's money, but it's also about race. It's mm. about, it's your gender presentation, right? Like if you are a, a masculine leaning woman, like you're never, you're never going to be able to, to do that or you're going to have to, to change certain parts of your, it's like all of this stuff intersects in ways that is just unattainable for the vast majority of women. Right. And so if we are serious about this, the project of feminism, if we're serious about what I would call social transformation, then we have to be questioning it every step of the way. And right. I want to question it, and I don't want to be too hard on the women who choose that, because right. I get it, like, we're just navigating these systems we didn't create, I totally. get it. But let's just be cognizant, right? Like, let's not just let that stuff go unchecked. How do you make the feminism that you talk about and that you uh, promote through For Harriet, how do you make it class inclusive? Um, I, I think my first thing is recognizing that I come from a very class privileged background. And so I make it a point to say that my background should not be the default because right. everybody does not have college educated, graduate level educated parents. Mm -hmm. I went to wonderful schools. I knew from a really young age that I had lots and lots of options. Right. College was inevitable. Like, that's just what we were going to do. And so I make it a point to, if we are talking about um, what poor women need, I can speak for a poor woman. Right. You know, I think that there's this idea of, like, I'm going to give a voice to the voiceless. I want to, it's like, no, 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 no. They have their own voices. Yeah. Right? So what we need to do is be listening to women who come from a different kind of, what I need to do to make sure that my feminism is not bullshit, is listen to women who have the, that background, who right. have those experiences, right. that they need to be centered in a conversation about what lower income women need, what poor women need. And so I can be supportive and I can um, direct people to your books or your channel or your Twitter. I can do that, but I cannot fill that gap. Right. I think that's, um, I think that feminism really has to be as much about learning and listening as it is about, you know, getting our hot takes off. I agree. I think it's also about what do you consider a success? Uh, as an example, like a lot of times a measure of how feminist a company is, is going to be how many women are on their executive board. But to me, if you have a female CEO, but no comprehensive maternity leave, right. or like the majority of your lowest paid workers are women, that's not a feminist company. Right. Right. And I think we've seen this with them. Um, I don't know if I shouldn't say names, but there are these feminist companies that Name names. <laughs> where it's like, um, like thanks has come on. Through. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah. And it's like these companies away, away, you know, girl they boss. Girl, boss. girl boss. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> so they, um, espouse these ostensibly feminist values and like, that's a part of their branding and like, we're community sisters. Right. right. But like, how are you treating your employees? Yeah. Um, what type of culture is there? You, you, these things are incompatible. You can't treat people like shit and then say that you're a feminist company. In some ways, I think that that, that whole phenomenon, I, I don't think it's intentional in the sense that like, I don't think people intentionally set out to create a toxic environment for women or they set out to use, you know, quote unquote, sort of um, corporate feminism as a shield for that. But what I think often happens is like, if you look at companies that have, you know, female founders, female leaders who are working insane hours, who are, you know, putting themselves in a, in a really high stress position. And let's be honest, oftentimes have access to things like a lot of domestic help and like a, an ability to throw themselves into work to an extreme degree. I can see how it would be easy then even without trying to be like, well, why can't you other women do it? I can do it, yeah. you know? And I feel like that's part of the the whole idea of like having it all. Yeah. It's like ultimately that just comes down to how much money and help you have. Yeah. You I know? mean, our ideals of success are so masculinized. So it's like if the only way to be able to work, like you said, like 80 hours a week or whatever you gotta have some help at home. Like, who's cooking your meals, who's taking care of your kids, who's cleaning your home. Right. Um, and you also have to dig into this idea of like, 
it's grind culture, like hustle till you die. And like that stuff, those ideals are created by men. This idea of we're hyper competitive and do whatever it takes and right. by any means necessary. And so if you have, if you've tapped into that, like if you have not done the work necessary to question it and deconstruct it and like, what is it that way? And you have bought into it wholesale, then that stuff is going to creep into your company. And it doesn't matter how um, girl bossy it is. You, you can't, the structures of your company have to be fundamentally compatible with like collaboration and like right. we help each other and like an understanding of like nobody does it alone. Totally. We, we are only able to do this because we have help. And so, you know, just, just reject it. And it's hard to reject that stuff, especially, you know, one of the reasons why I never wanted to raise money is because once you take the money, you have decided that you're going to um, dial into those ideals and those values and those priorities. And there is no, there is no wiggle room to say, oh, but maybe we can slow down a little bit, or maybe we can have some allowances, or maybe we can spend more money on um, providing maternity leave for three months and that stuff. When, when um, profit is the only thing that matters, then you're going to have to trade some values for, to make some money. Totally. I think what you said earlier about the car going back to the Kardashians as like when people will prop them up as feminist ideals. It's like the question really is, well, to what extent does their empowerment trickle down? Yeah. And I feel like that's that applies just the same whether you're running company, no matter what your situation is, it's like, does empowerment for you translate to empowerment for those around you? Yeah. You know, or is it just you doing a lot better? Yeah. I think a lot of people it's so easy once you're on the path to believe, genuinely believe that if you rise, then you're gonna bring everybody else with right. you. And we see this in all sorts of marginalized communities. Like, you know, there's this idea of like the model minority and whatever. It's like, you really believe once you're really in it, like I'm doing great and I'm uplifting the race and losing that, that larger structural analysis. And I think that if we make it all individualist, like, capitalist America tells us that it should be, then we lose sight of the fact that we are a small part of these gigantic structures. Right. And if we want to make things better, like if you really care about your community, which I think a lot of people really do feel like they care, then you really need to be tuned into, how, how did this happen? How, do, how Why is right. it that only so few people can be successful and then everybody else on the bottom has to scrimp and save and worry about how they're going to pay for their health insurance and worry about how they're going to pay for child care? How did that happen? It didn't just happen. And then you have to, and this is the hard part, is thinking about, and how am I contributing to that inequality? And how am I benefiting from it? I right. think it's really difficult and um, scary and it makes you feel uneasy to be like, oh, I'm here because somebody else is getting screwed. Totally. And so instead of having to do that self-reflection, we dial into this idea of like, it's me and like, I'm the savior. And it's like, no, like, that's not how it works. I think it's also that like people, like we talk a lot about on the channel about all kinds of privileges. And I feel like people are very, very reluctant to acknowledge any kind of privilege I think particularly financial privilege people are often very good about hiding. I think partially because they have a strong feeling that it will make their accomplishments less impressive. And the truth is it does, yeah. but that's not a bad thing, Yeah. you know? And you have to kind of lean into that feeling of like, you know, there are certain privileges that I didn't have growing up and certain ones that I did. Mm -hmm. And it, you can't only pick the ones you didn't have. Yeah, totally. You also have to acknowledge the ones you did and say to yourself, like, okay, it probably was marginally easier yeah. for me to do X or Y. You still got to do it. You're yeah. still reaping the benefits of having accomplished that thing, you yeah. know? But people want their cake and eat it and to, and to be able to eat it too. But there's there are these cultural myths that we all are fed, you know, like the Horatio Alger story of I came from nothing and then I became that hero and I'm the master of my own destiny. And we really want, I think especially in like the social media age where we're all constantly trying to craft our narratives and uh, you know like it's an old thing but there's something very particular about how it plays out when we're all trying to be the star of our own like reality show and like project these images about ourselves and these ideas about who we think we are it's like yeah it doesn't mean you didn't work hard i think that like i know lots of 
very privileged people who are hard workers. It just means that like the the barriers that would have prevented you from even being able to reach that first rung, they weren't there. And let's right. igno- and let's acknowledge that. And it's not your fault that they weren't there, but like you have to if you want to be a not shitty person, you have to acknowledge it. And I th- yes, and I feel like when you because we've had people on this show who are rich beyond belief. Mm-hmm. Um, and you, we see all kinds, right? Like we see people who are incredibly reluctant to discuss the kind of money that they have. And we've noticed that kind of without fail, I mean, listen, we have a self-selecting audience who likes when people are transparent, mm-hmm. but I think even still, even when it gets outside of our own little bubble and other people see it, without fail, if you're a rich person, and you come on one of our shows and you don't disclose and you say, well, we're comfortable or you make mm-hmm. euphemisms to kind of explain away, you know, the financial access you have incredibly negative response. Yeah. But the people that we've had on who are very transparent about like, I have X or I grew up with Y who share numbers, yeah. who get really into it. The res- the response is overwhelmingly positive because the thing is that people are smart. Yeah. They know whether or not you're telling them. The question is whether or not you're willing to be honest yeah. about it. Mm-hmm. And I think it takes a lot of emotional maturity to do that because, yeah, you have to be comfortable with, on some level, like you said, the idea that, like, you had an easier time getting there yeah. because someone else had a harder time. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think that we're just in this political moment where people are like, this is rigged, okay? The system is rigged. And we want you to be honest about the fact that it's rigged. Yes. And people really resent you if you try to pretend like those barriers of entry are not there. There is so much, I think, people have been talking about Bernie Sanders a lot recently, right? And so it's like Bernie Sanders is a millionaire now because, I don't know, he's like 80 or whatever, right? But like, he's a millionaire. But like, this is a man who is, and I mean, this is not a Sanders endorsement, I'm just saying that, like, one of the reasons why people gravitate to this man, despite the fact that he is now very, very wealthy, is he is so clear about the fact that, like, this is rigged. And it should not be so hard for you to access health care. You should not have to work two jobs to pay rent on a one-bedroom apartment, right? right? We want people to say, this is unfair. Right. And if you, as a super rich, privileged person, cannot acknowledge that this is unfair, guillotine (laughs) it is so true Uh, one thing though that i will say that i feel like holds us back so much as a society just in terms of a small point of comprehension is people have such a hard time understanding the difference between a million of something and a billion of something yeah because a million okay so a million dollars for context i think it's 1.4 million that's about the amount of money that you need at retirement in order to take out i think it's like a sixty five thousand dollar income for the next like 20 some years it's not that much money like it is truly not a lot of money when you're looking at potentially not taking in an income for the next you know however long your retirement's gonna be yes of course having a million dollars at the end of your life is uh, well (laughs) at the end of your life later in your life (laughs) is is it's a lot it's a lot that many people never have but the difference between one million dollars and one billion dollars like if you were to visualize that it would be the difference between going down the street and going to the moon like these are really (laughs) different numbers and i feel like if people understood what a billion dollars means i think people really don't i don't think they do it's a thousand million (laughs) yes yeah yeah i think it's difficult for us to to comprehend and i do think that we do ourselves a disservice by lumping all wealthy people into the same bucket no 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 no. like bernie sanders is not mike bloomberg like don't do that right like that's super disingenuous um one thing's like yeah you could make some smart decisions and and put things away in retirement accounts and at 77 78 years old have a million dollars in assets to get multiple billions of dollars totally you've exploited countless people you have to countless people are not able to afford food every month because you have multiple billions of dollars. Every billionaire is a policy failure. Yeah. All right. And now let's sing the, the internationally. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you ever feel, uh, we actually, so I do have some questions for you from our audience soon, um, but I, one of the themes that came up in our questions was that you are so candid, obviously, as our audience can see here, um, about your social and political and activist beliefs. Yeah. 
And I've even seen you be controversial, like when I watched your um, take on the Michael Jackson documentary, I was like, oh, setting yeah. herself up to get controversy. To, yeah. yeah, to get yeah. But the thing is that I, <laughs> I, I mean, I really respect that on a lot of levels. Just your your transparency with who you are, even in the face of it possibly being controversial. Yeah. Do you ever have there ever been times where you like kind of censored what you think in order to make a move? There are, well, in order to make, what do you mean? Make like, it? for example, to grow your brand. No, 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 no. Um, no, I feel like I say all the time, I am not primarily motivated by money. My mm. ultimate desire is not to hoard millions and millions of dollars. I care about money. I make a good living now. I care about money. I don't want to have to go back to the strip club, meaning corporate. Like, I don't want to do that. <laughs> um, so in order to be able to sustain myself and to hire people and to build a brand and a business, I have to care about money. However, um, I'm never going to be willing to trade my values or my voice in order to get a couple more thousands of subscribers on YouTube. That's not worth it to me. I know exactly who I want to emulate my career after. And I look at them mm. and, and see, I am obsessed with bell hooks. I love bell hooks. And uh, I'm obsessed with Cornell West, um, oh. histor other historical figures. I, I love um, a, an activist named Fannie Lou Hamer. Um, these are people who were willing to say what they truly believed was right. Mm. For And they were willing to accept that you might not be popular now, but it is more important to be honest and truthful and right than it is to be popular in the moment. Sure. And so I understand the economics of what I do. I get it. I love to look at numbers. I love to look at analytics. However, I also think it is my responsibility as somebody who has these deeply held beliefs to be consistent and to be honest. And I can't tell other people to go out there and be bold and stand up to injustice and don't sit next to your, your racist uncle and not say anything. I can't be out here saying that stuff and be on the internet lying. I can't right. do that. And, and I want to feel good about me. I want to look back in 5, 10, 15, 20 years and be like, yeah, like you didn't sell out. You told the truth. And maybe in 2019, people weren't into it. But they might be into it in 2039. We see that happen over and over again where people just like the, the mainstream ideology needed to catch up with them. Right. And I think it's possible. I mean, look, I'm not, I'm, 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 right? I could just be wrong. Sometimes I'm just wrong. <laughs> not me. Don't know that feeling. <laughs> Can't relate. <laughs> but, like, I know that I will never regret being honest and true to myself and my values in the moment. I might have to come back and say, oh, I was wrong. I was wrong. But at that point, I thought I was right. I never want to have to look back on something that I've made and be like, you were lying. Yeah, like, like you knew that was wrong. You knew that was wrong. Yeah. I think that's so immoral, and people do that all the time. That's true. And I think, you know, it's funny. Like, you mentioned earlier Cornell West, and I'm a huge, huge, it seems like petty to call yourself a fan. Yeah. Because it's like, what is he, a boy band? But but I'm someone who has followed him quite a lot. And I what I find interesting about people like that, and if you guys aren't familiar with him, definitely look him out. Look him up. Uh, but... What I find so interesting about it is that I have seen him be interviewed on so many shows with people who I think don't agree with him a lot. Yeah. But by the end of the interview, almost without exception, they are very into him yeah. and very and find themselves agreeing with them. And I think it's partially because one thing that I, I definitely get from him and a few other kind of public intellectuals is they always speak from ultimately a place of extreme compassion yeah. and extreme humanity. Yeah. And that's one of the things that I feel like on the internet in particular, you really lose as a form of just engaging with another yeah. person that you have to first and foremost, you know, I mean, he, I, this is like obviously something that he does. Like uh, he, he refers to most people as brother or sister, but mm -hmm. like even people with whom he radically disagrees. Mm -hmm. But I think that's a very interesting rhetorical thing in the sense that even in disagreeing with someone, it immediately puts you in the position of relating to mm -hmm. them and understanding them on a more human level. And I think when I look around at like, even on the YouTube community, the ones who get the most views are often the ones who take really harsh positions that I'm not even sure they believe themselves. Right. But the ones who have sustained 
presences are the ones who have kind of, they've not always been on the most popular side of an issue, but they've been very true to themselves. Yeah, I think that like, something that I absolutely take from both Cornell West, because I don't know him, Cornell, we're My buddy Cornell. (laughs) Um, But things that I take from Cornell West and Bell Hooks is this idea of like, you know, Cornell West is very, very religious, right? And mm-hmm. so he has this idea of beloved community. And, like, there are going to be people in your community that you don't always ag- agree with. Like, we might not be on the same page about everything, but we are still connected. You right. know, like, we are both still humans trying to navigate, like, what's the best for ourselves and our families and our friends. And so I might think that, like, you took a, a political position that I think is heinous. I think it's disgusting and despicable. However, and like, this is not super popular on the internet. It's not super popular to say, I think that that political position you took is disgusting, but I can still have empathy and compassion for you as a human trying to navigate this human experience. And people come for me all the time because like, we don't need to be offering any sympathy for a racist or a sexist or whatever. Like, I understand, I get it. You know, you want to protect your energy. However, it's just is not too much for me to extend that to other people. It right. might be too much for you, and you can take whatever posture that you want to, but for me, it is critical, and I think a part of this is because I was raised by a conservative, but like, it is critical for me to be able to see you as a, a human, and we're never gonna agree, and we're gonna argue, and we're gonna go back and forth, but I still see your humanity, and ultimately, I don't want you to suffer. You right. know, and that's where that brother and sister stuff comes in. Like, if if we if we understand that we are all linked, you know, like that our destinies are are mutual, are are mutually interconnected, then it becomes much more difficult to lead with nastiness and to lead with malice. Just the, from 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 my vantage point, for other people, I don't know, they're they're not gonna get it. But for me, it just that makes the most sense. I agree, and I think. You know, I will have will have people on on TFD that I don't agree with. And I have always found in general that when you're talking to someone that you don't agree with, I mean, provided that they're like a decent person on mm-hmm. just a human level, because there are some people that it's like, don't even bother. Like, yeah. there's nothing there. But w- if someone is willing to have a discussion, I think oftentimes even just in asking a question that they probably haven't considered. Yeah. There's there's usually a door somewhere yeah. on people. Yeah. And I and I always think especially when it comes to like cuz we talk when you know our audience is all over the financial spectrum in terms of privilege and the the frustrating thing about that like you know obviously the right thing to do if you are someone who has more financial privilege is to be the person who is more acquiescent, Mm -hmm. who is more empathetic, who gives more of yourself. Obviously, I think we can know that on an intellectual level. But you put a couple friends in a group at different income levels, Mm -hmm. it is really, really hard to enact that in real life. And I feel like one of the biggest things that people fear, whether it's talking about politics or talking about money or any other taboo topic, is that fear of vulnerability yeah. um, and feeling like they might be judged or they might be called out or any of that. And so the more you can you can lead with that love and compassion, the more you'll open everyone up to doing the same and, and those fears will kind of break down. And we've seen even, again, when it comes to talking about money, that I don't think for most social groups there's a more taboo topic yeah. and a more taboo like difference and in, in being able to relate to each other. And we hear all the time people saying, like, I'm just afraid to even say, like, I can't afford that. Yeah. You yeah. know? So if you start leading with that compassion, people will feel infinitely more able to respond in kind and to say, hey, can I be honest with you about my situation? Yeah. You know? Yeah. I don't want to, and I feel, this is such, it's so complicated, right? Because I feel like I don't want to put undue burdens on people who are already marginalized totally. when we're talking about love and compassion and all of that stuff. I think one of the reasons why so many people reject that framework is because they're like, well, no, we're already disadvantaged. We're, we don't want to do more work. Okay? <laughs> we don't want to do more work. I, I understand that and I, I get why people opt out and why they take the positions that they take. However, I also want to think about effectiveness. Right. And I also, I wouldn't be a feminist if I didn't think people could change. Then there's no reason to even hold these beliefs if I thought that people were stuck in the same place. 
And also I think about myself, I think about how I have evolved on so many issues over the years. Oh my God. <laughs> yeah. My the way that I talk about class has it's so different. Um, I didn't grow up understanding trans identities and trans experiences. I didn't have access to that. I've had to learn and become less, frankly, less shitty and less bigoted. But I recognize my personal transformation and I think I'm not that special. I'm not that smart. Other people can do this too. Yeah. And so the reason why I approach my political conversations and these discussions the way that I do is because I think I'm not that exceptional. Everybody can everybody can get yeah. here if they're open. And everybody's not gonna be open. We have to we have to say sometimes we're just gonna have to leave you where you are. But for that sliver of people who are reachable. If we want them to come into the folds, how are we going to get them there? You know, that's that's how we change things. So, yes, we all need to be super empathetic to others, but we also need to do right by ourselves. And one of the best ways to do that is by taking care of your own personal budget. Listen, you guys know I love mint. There's no secret. I love mint. I think it's great. I've been using it for seven years. But if you do not know what mint is, it is an extremely cool app, totally free, that syncs up with all of your accounts and your credit cards and your credit score and basically just gives you a nice way of managing your day-to-day -day personal finances and budget in a way that doesn't like feel completely overwhelming, like making Excel spreadsheets, which is like extremely not my thing. They provide you all kinds of tools like reminders and calculators for helping reach your goals. They give you notifications if you're going over budget in a certain category. They make you nice little beautiful pie charts for all of your various spending habits. It is just the perfect tool to getting a hold on your budget and making sure that you're working toward the goals that are important to you. I have used it for literally years and years since before I even started TFD and it still helps me make the best decisions I can with my own money. So if you've been thinking about getting a hold on your finances, I highly recommend checking out Mint in the link in our description or our show notes. So Kim, we got quite a lot of questions for you okay. from our audience and I have to say that you guys really have um, extremely high ambitions for her ability to answer some of these questions because some of these are big ones. Okay. So do your best. Uh, feel free sure. to pass on them. All right. First question. Uh, how can Americans fix the pay gap between gender and race? As a black woman myself, a lot of people discredit me because they just don't believe that a discrepancy exists. How can I advocate for myself to receive higher pay like my white male and female counterparts? I am going to straight up say I have literally no idea. Um, <laughs> I, I wish. Okay. So these are, again, like those huge structural things that like I I don't know I don't have the expertise to do and also I will say that I opted out of corporate America early I worked in corporate like six months and I was like I gotta get out because mm. I don't want to have to deal with that so any um advice that I'd be giving would just be completely made up and so no I can't I'm sorry but I, I know it's real I believe you um, but you should probably talk to somebody who like has experience in that because it's not me. So, uh, I am obviously not equipped to give advice on advocating for yourself, closing the racial wealth gap, clearly not my wheelhouse, but I will say for advocating for your own compensation at work, uh, cause we do talk quite a lot about that thing, that sort of thing. And there, that does exist for women as well on the gender line. So there is some overlap there. One technique, quote unquote, that I think is very important that everyone remember is that in the vast majority of cases, in order to get a raise over a certain number, in order to increase your income over a certain number, it is almost inevitable that you will have to go to a different company. It is very unlikely given most companies, most companies, not all, but a lot of companies operate on a pay grade, essentially raises. Like you get a certain bump and they don't go over that certain bump. And a lot of people make the mistake of when they get a job that they pretty much like, and they feel relatively comfortable in, they stay in it too long. So I will say that one thing, and, and there are studies that show that uh, men are often um, much more proactive about looking for other jobs, about soliciting other offers, even possibly leveraging those offers with their current employer, even if they don't take the job. So one thing I just always say to the audience is like, 
never feel bad about looking at other options and potentially taking other options and using what could potentially be those offers to even potentially leverage yourself something better in your current job. A lot of people feel an outsized degree of loyalty to their employers, especially women, and I would imagine especially people of color. You don't know those people shit. Like you are not your employer. If they had to cut costs, they would lay you off in a heartbeat. So just keep that in mind and remember that your job is not a gift. You are working for them and that's why they're giving you the money. And if you're not getting the, the amount of money you believe that you should get, feel empowered and entitled to look elsewhere. That being said, the structural issues, I vote Bernie Sanders. I don't know, I'm kidding. Uh, I have no idea. Um, <clears throat> what are your financial priorities now versus five years ago? And also what are some free slash inexpensive ways that she treats herself? Um, okay, so my financial priorities now, um, now I'm 30, and I just realized, I mean, I didn't just realize, but over the past year, I've really been thinking hard about the fact that, like, I don't want to be broke when I'm 60. I don't want to be struggling financially. And so my priorities now are saving and investing. And so five years ago, seven, eight years ago, my financial priority was stunting. Like, buying the, like, <laughs> the cutest stuff. I've, I have so many pairs of Christian Louboutin shoes. I don't even <gasps> wear them anymore. What? They're not cute to me anymore. I have designer bags that I don't even wear anymore. They're not cute. Now, the thing about designer bags, sorry, not to go off on this tangent, but designer bags do hold their value. So if you buy the right bag, it can be an investment. So some of those bags are still worth as much or more than what I purchased them for. Not the way I treat purses. Oh, but. okay. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I realized that like that stuff is does not matter. That stuff does not matter. I think as I see my parent, my mom aging, and the older people in my community aging, it has become more and more clear to me that like oh like they have to take care of themselves. You know, like, um, this this social security Ponzi scheme, like, it's not going to be around for our generation. So I need to make sure that I have a firm financial foundation. And so I keep a set amount in my checking account. And every month, anything over that at the beginning of the month goes directly into a savings. Yay. I'm here saving. Um, and then cheap things that I do for self-care. I feel like my Netflix account is self-care, my Hulu account is self-care. Um, what, what is cheap? I don't know if I do a lot of cheap stuff. Um, I subscribe to the New York Times crossword app. Um, so I do a lot of crosswords. Luxury. It's like, I want to say it's like $3 a month. Crossword's like such a smart person thing. Like I feel so <laughs> bad at them. I mean, I don't do the, there's hard ones. There's really hard ones that I'm like, oh, I don't know. I don't know, like Wagner's Fifth Symphony. Um, so I do that. What else do I do for self-care? That's cheap. Crosswords and Sudoku is like my self-care. I don't know if I do anything else. I go to Starbucks sometimes. I don't know. Um, so for those who may not know, um, we are sitting in the presence of an elite Ivy oh, League, gosh. Ivy Leaguer, uh, Harvard, <laughs> if I'm not mistaken. Uh, yeah. Woo! Ooh la la. Um, so we got a lot of questions about that. Okay. Uh, notably, um, we have a question that says, what, can she talk about student loans from going to an Ivy League? How being a recovering workaholic affects her finances and numbers, numbers, numbers. Okay. Our audience loves sharing numbers. Student loans. Um, so most elite schools don't offer merit-based scholarships. So Is that true? Yeah. So it's all need-based. So they look at your finances and the finances of your parents and they say you can afford this. So this is how much you need to pay. And I've had lots and lots of conversations with my friends about this, particularly my friends of color, my black friends about this, because that puts people who don't have generational wealth at a distinct disadvantage. Right. It's a whole thing. Um, so um, I ended up with about mm, like $50,000 in loans, maybe 55. I think I'm down to like 45 now. And that's for a bachelor's. Yeah, for undergrad. Mm -hmm. And um, 
that's they were just like this is what you can afford like every everybody's parent can afford fifteen thousand like yeah everybody's parent can write out fifteen thousand dollar check like, oh my god um so yeah but I so when I see people who took out a hundred thousand dollars for undergrad I'm like no <laughs> like, oh my god don't it is insane to me and so. And I think I feel particularly bad for people who really didn't like their undergraduate experience. I loved my undergraduate experience. I had the best time. I would choose it again and again. Um, so yeah, that's a lot of money, but for the experience, I, I it's okay, it's cool. But I, I do feel bad for people who are like, I hate it, I didn't learn anything. This degree is worse than toilet, you more useless than toilet paper. Like, yeah. Um and then what's the the other how one? being a former like recovered workaholic affects your finances. Oh yeah. Oh okay. Um so I have decided that life is short and so True. I am not going to spend all of my waking hours thinking about work and like trying to work myself to death. Mm. I want to have great experiences. I want to have great relationships with my friends and family and I choose to invest myself and my time in that stuff. You know, I want to look back on my 20s and 30s um, forward on my deathbed. I want to look back and be like, we had a great time. And um, the royal we. Like, we, we like, I mean, like, <laughs> we, like, we, we had, had a great time. So, back at, like, <laughs> oh, I, I love to do stuff with my nieces, right? So, like, one thing that I even do now is like, remember two summers ago when we went to the, the pool? Like, you know, <laughs> Um, so because I am investing myself in relationships, that's why I think of it in the we, like, yeah. how do we relate to each other? Yeah. Um, so, uh, I know that because I am not grinding, grinding, grinding every day that, yeah, I'm leaving some money on the table, you know, like instead of making like low six figures, I can be making mid six figures or whatever. But I just think that there are things that are more important than how much money is in my bank account. And yeah, that's a privilege. It is a privilege. Mm -hmm. You can only think like that once you get to a certain kind of financial stability. Absolutely. Um, but now that I'm there, I want to make sure that like every single day is like we made a memory. Um, I didn't choose money over going to a recital. I didn't choose money over going to a birthday party or a retirement party. And that stuff really, really matters to me. And back in my workaholic days and the the mid when I was in my mid twenties, I was like, no, I'm not. I've skipped family reunions before, which is so stupid. I've skipped birthday parties, retirement parties, recitals. Uh, it's like, for what? For what? For money that's gone now anyway? For no. that closet full of Louis Vuitton. Yeah, that I don't even wear. That aren't even cute anymore. They're tacky. Like, no, it's not worth it. Man, I have to say, I feel very lucky that of all the stupid purchases I made in my life, I've never been into designer clothes or accessories. Yeah, it's not. I mean, you know, I still like a designer or something every once in a while. Um, <laughs> but that is not where I am putting the money because it's just stupid. You know, it's just trends, trends come and go. Yeah, I like every. I want to get like a like a zapper for myself because occasionally I'll like see one of those. Like I don't know why I think they're cute, but like the Gucci belt that's like yeah. the Gucci's. I think that's cute. Like, what does that say? But like, I'm like, get get over it, Chelsea. You don't need the I Gucci belt. We can splurge if you have a little <laughs> bit extra. I think it's okay to treat yourself. Like, what is that from? What show is that from? Parks and Rec. Parks and Rec, right? Like, I think it's okay, and I don't want to have guilt about the ways that I treat myself. I just want to make sure that there is balance in the way that I'm dealing with my financial life and my personal life. Yeah. No, you're right. But for what it's worth, though, like, I ha I, I'll invest in things clothing-wise, but it's always, like, getting, like, a nice pair of boots or a winter coat that aren't, yeah. like, really, like, designer. It's yeah. just, like, but those are expensive. Yeah. But, yeah, no. I'm, I never got Louis Vuittons. They seem uncomfortable. Are they uncomfortable? They are so, that's the other thing. <laughs> They're so uncomfortable. You can't even wear them. I have, like, put them on at 7, and then by, like, 8 o'clock, you're like, I've got to sit down. Like, we've got to do something. Those are shoes that are made for people who have car services. Yeah. Yeah. It's drivers. literally, like, it's literally you wear them from your car to the front door of the restaurant or the club, and then you sit down, you know, and then maybe you, you do a lap around wherever you are because you want people to see them. 
and then one laugh yeah like <laughs> and then you sit down again but they're they're not functional at all and again generally i just think they're just they're just not the cutest thing in the world to me anymore yeah i feel like they had their moment okay yeah. so fun fact in addition to being an elite ivy what's League going on grad we're going? You're also a forbes 30 under 30 oh yeah yeah wow Talk about credentials. Um, okay, so we have a question related to that. That's okay. why I bring it up. Uh, how does she really feel about 30 under 30 lists? Oh, gosh. Um, what's, how honest? Okay, so I think that... Very honest. <laughs> so I think we have to be real about the fact that any list, all of these lists, any list that I've been on is a function of your networks, it's a function of the brands that are attached to your name. It's who you know. It's also like how well you can kind of game these systems, like your visibility. It's not necessarily a reflection of the work that you do, your capabilities, um, your intelligence. It's like, it's not that. It's like all the other intangible stuff that reproduces inequality. And I am very, very honest about that. Um, so I think that like it was one of my goals really early on to get on an under 30 list. I definitely think that I have gotten second looks from people and gotten opportunities because of that the same way that I get second looks and opportunities because of the Harvard Association. But again, as we were talking about earlier, we have to be very, very honest about the fact that like it is unfair. It is unfair. Those systems are rigged. I think that we put way too much emphasis on achieving a certain thing by a certain age. Now that I'm 30, I'm like, I'm, I'm still young. I'm not washed because I'm 30 now. <laughs> Why are we trying to like convince these kids that like if you don't do this thing by the time you get to this age that like you're a failure? It just, it plays into all of these like pathologies that are ultimately unhelpful. So I will say rigged unfair um individually it has been beneficial in certain ways yeah i mean isn't that the truth about most yeah unfair rigged beneficial yeah. um yeah well as someone who's never made any list of any kind i wholeheartedly endorse that take <laughs> they're bad <laughs> uh, but i will say that being said there is an a uh, in, in our cultural in our culture generally but particularly on the internet a youth obsession yeah. where i'm like i don't even want like you know what the, the extent of our youth obsession on the internet is we have 25-year-olds working at magazines to give their skincare routine tips. Yes! I'm like, get out of my face, 20-year-old. Yes. Like, I don't want to hear what your youthful baby self does to take care of your perfect skin. Yeah, I mean, it's like, I don't want to be the person who peaked in high school. I don't want to be the person who peaked in college or peaked when I was 26, when I got on that list. I think that we should internalize this idea that, like, Life is not, it's not a destination. Like this is a journey and it's ongoing. And I am excited to do, diff try new things. I mean, like doing YouTube the way that I do it now is like a, a new thing that I have put myself into after being on that list. You know, it's like, there's always a new adventure. And I hope that when we are making these under 30 lists and all of this ridiculous emphasis on youth and like get here and be there, we are, we are, are um, in our imaginations, we are foreclosing our ability to imagine greatness after a certain age or greatness mm. beyond a timeline. Totally. And like, I love looking at success stories of people who are like 55 or 60 or like, um, there's this, there's a, a story of a woman who was um, a Princeton professor, a tenured English professor at Princeton. And after she retired, she was like, you know what? I want to be a visual artist now. Like, that's what I want to do. And so she went to art school after she had had this huge career as an English professor at Princeton. Like, there's so much more to life. And so I feel like I have to counsel younger people, like, it's okay. It's fine. Like, yes. there's not. I only follow influencers on Instagram over the age of 50 as a rule. No. Uh, now, granted, like, if I'm following someone that I follow for other reasons, like, you know, I, like... I will follow, you know, other people who have some platform on the age. But anyone who's, like, an influencer, who's yeah. just, who I'm just following because they, like, post cute outfits, only over 50. Wow. It has changed my life. Because not only is it so exciting to see women over a certain age just be seen that way and be beautiful and in charge of their, you know, appearance and their presentation, all that stuff, and feeling sexy and great. Most of these women started Instagramming at, like, 55 yeah. after doing a whole bunch of other stuff. And so it just has that wonderful energy of like 
never feeling like you've passed a point in your life yeah. where something's open to you. And I also feel like it's important to not feel, to never have any life achievement or goal or anything specifically associated with an age, which is why I hate those articles. It's like how much you should have saved by X age. Yeah. Aside from the massive privilege inherent in those articles, it's also like, I always used to think I, I should own a home by 30. Yeah. And I'm 31. And even before I turned 30, I was like, I don't even want to own a home. Yeah. Like, and But I never even considered that like a choice. Yeah. It was just what I was supposed to do. And thank God I didn't buy a house because of that. Yeah, yeah. I, I do think that like, especially now, you know, millennial generations and like Gen Z, just the ability to achieve some of those milestones is just not there for us. No. Right? Like I looked at what my mom was doing when she was my age and I was like, I'm not, it's not going to happen. Sorry, it's just not going to happen, right? And again, like, not to, like, overemphasize the structural stuff, but, like, yeah, like, the structure of the economy has changed. Um, the, our ability to amass these assets, it's changed. So we have to change our own milestones and, and have it be individualized to our own, not only, like, our own age milestones, but also our, our own desires. I don't want to have two homes and two kids, you know, at 30. Like, I don't want that. <laughs> like, no. It doesn't seem fun to me. So like we have to really be open to like carving our own paths and like doing it at our own pace. When my mom was my age, she had my sister who was like seven or something, was married and she was pregnant with me like at this exact age. And it's like, can you even imagine like, first of all, you have a house, so you have to make sure like all the pressures that come with having a house and then you have a husband, you have to have those pressures like making sure that like a child doesn't die every day like that is insane and then you have another kid in there and you have to make sure that you're eating right and you're not stressed it's just like it's so much I'm like I think about being married and I'm like what like it's <laughs> it, it, it's insane to me so it's just like I value that she had that stuff and she was fulfilled by it but I have freedom and I'm fulfilled by that it's just different yeah. <laughs> Whatever, whatever. This yeah. is a, this is an interesting one. If you've seen Parasite, uh, I have, I have seen Parasite, and I think that that person um, tweets me about Parasite very regularly. They that is strange. Um, there, I think that Parasite Hive is upset with me because I have not made a video about Parasite. Interesting. Yeah. Wow. That takes, like, you have to be really into something to be upset with someone for not saying something. Yeah, yeah. There, I will get to it one day. Super fascinating movie. Um, Bong Joon-ho. Who? Ho? Is that what his name is? Bong Joon-ho? I think it's Bong Joon-ho. Bong Joon-ho. Uh, brilliant. Incredibly well-directed film. Please leave me alone. No, <laughs> like they're just harassing me. About that it. is so strange. Uh, oh my god, I got multiple people on Instagram asking if you would weigh in on the James Charles Tati Westbrook thing, which I think is primarily because I talked about it for on the channel again. I talked about it like two days ago, so like yeah. a year after it happened. Um, James, I think that I actually agreed with your take. Is like oh, something that something that I really believe firmly is that. Grown people need to stay out of teenager mess, okay? So how old is she? Sure. He's 19, 20? He's 20 now, 19 at the time. Okay. And she was 37. Yeah. Yeah. Not a good look. I think that we can have our thoughts and opinions and feelings about things. I get it. It's, it was like the biggest story on the internet for a few days. But I also think that if you are firmly in your 30s, that you should just charge it to the game, okay? 19-year-olds... <laughs> They're ridiculous. They're going to be 19-year-olds. Yeah, they're ridiculous. They're stupid. Like, what were you doing when you were 19? Well, I don't know what you're doing, right? But I know that when I was 19, I was making the worst decisions imaginable. Okay? Oh, yeah. So okay. there's no... If a 30-something person was trying to come to my 19-year-old self talking about, you did this wrong, I'd be like, girl... Go like, die. Right? It's like, don't you have a mortgage to pay? Like, <laughs> like, leave me alone. I really do think that an unfortunate thing about the internet, I've gone off on this before but like an unfortunate thing about the internet is like we're all together and like we're seeing everybody's stuff all the time there's no segmentation in community so it feels like everyone's part of the same group and yeah. we're not yeah but we're not no. we are not we are different i'm in a different place and so it is distressing to me that grown folks that 
grown people feel so emboldened and entitled to comment on people who are just trying to figure it out. These are people at the very beginning of adulthood. You go be grown. Let them be messy. Yep. Yeah. But I do think it's funny because I, I, uh, when I talked about it on the video, like I, it's more in the context, like you're saying about like the general internet yeah. and how it completely flattens yeah. the conversation into thinking like, we're all just like hanging out at a party yeah. and it's like, we are for sure not. We're not. Um, but it does like, I'm, and actually on that note, because the whole like thesis of the video, I'll link it in the description is, uh, show notes. it's, um, basically just like getting older on the internet, which kind of is scary to me, but I feel like if you are proactive about it it can be manageable. So to that end, like, how do you, what steps are you taking to age gracefully on the internet? Yeah, I think that I definitely am always thinking about what the next thing is. Do I expect to be making YouTube videos in five years? No, I don't. And so that means that I have to set things up so that I can do other stuff. And if I want this to be a real business with employees that like, gives offers like health insurance and a 401k, then I need to be making smart financial decisions and like taking those steps to make sure that this thing is sustainable. And so I am all the time thinking about, okay, like I, what's the next video going to be, but also working on the book proposal, also working on, we're not just going to do the YouTube, we're going to launch the newsletter, relaunch the website. Um, we are going to potentially pitch other kinds of projects to larger media companies. Like, how are we going to sustain and expand beyond just Kimberly the individual? Mm -hmm. And I think that like, if you are an influencer, if you have a platform, you always just have to be thinking about the next thing because I've certainly, you know, I, I ran this really, really successful blog and um, as a lot of media companies, they like there's this big, you know, Facebook changes the algorithms and then your media business is no longer sustainable because I've been through that before. I understand that like as soon as it can come, it can go. So like you've got to have like five different things in place at all times. Very well put. I agree. So we have come to that most famous of times on the financial confessions. So every guest, we ask them a series of rapid fire questions. Okay. Now you don't have to, you know, you can go a little longer if you need to, and you can skip if you need to. Okay. But uh, let's go through these and I'll give you uh, a little bit of context for some of them. So number one, what is the big financial secret of your industry? And let's say, because we have had a fair amount of YouTubers on, why don't we say advocacy? Um, the big financial secret? Oh, gosh. Or, alternatively, of Ivy League colleges. Oh. I don't know if it's a secret, but, like, at Ivy's, like, everybody has the same background. I don't know <laughs> if that's, that's not a secret, but, like, but I'll even say for, like, people of color, right? This is a big thing of, like, all of my best, best friends that I met in college, we are all, like, the same person but from different parts of the country it's, how so it's so interesting like we'll talk about we'll sit around and talk about our upbringings and like what type of school did you go to oh like that haven't been at my school what did your parents do oh my, my parents kind of did that too um uh or um it's just like or the feeling of, of um we're just like, we present ourselves a lot, like in the same kind of way, like we speak kind of the same way. We have a lot of the same cultural references. Our parents do roughly the same thing. The communities that we come from kind of look the same different place. Or I do know a lot of people who also went to elite like boarding schools or, you know, like that's like a, a step above. I went to public school. But it's like, even in the diversity, there is homogeneity. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah, I read um, uh, some statistic about how also, like, even amongst the diversity stats that uh, Ivy League schools will promote, they don't often specify that most of those children are the children of immigrants. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not even mostly students coming from, like, generations of Americans. Right. It's, it's like, it's that. It's like, there's lots of, yeah, especially, like, in the Black community, there's a whole, there's a whole back and forth about... Um, 
how most of the people who get accepted into IVs, like they are the first generation, um, maybe second generation. Um, and then also it's like, I don't know, like if everybody's parent is a lawyer, a doctor, an accountant, uh, an engineer, um, I come from an engineer and an accountant. Like if, if everybody is that, like, like you, you're expected to, you know, yeah. you know, yeah. And so the diversity kind of, it's right. It's fake. Well, yeah. that's part of the reason why class has to be so much more a part of the conversation. Yeah. Like it is really, really rare that you will see any organization really of any kind touting having class diversity right. like as part of their makeup that ju- I feel like I mean maybe that happens but I feel like I never see it yeah and that's a really easy way to your point to have a group of people who are diverse on, on one axis but on every other right from an extremely similar background yeah mm-hmm. yeah and I think it, and again it's it's hard especially now that we're having these conversations about eliminating legacy emissions that's another thing it's like a lot of the black people like uh, they have a parent who like wants our, you know, it's like, um, so I think it's difficult to think about the fact that like, if I am deeply invested in dismantling these systems of inequality, that means that my niece is not going to get legacy preference. And like, I have to be okay with that. And am I 100% okay with that? Nope. God's working on me. But, oh, but I, I intellectually, I know that that's what needs to happen. Um, but, but it's it's hard to to relinquish that that privilege. Well, honestly, I feel like the great first step is that you're being super transparent about the fact that like you come from a good amount of privilege and you are similar to a lot of the backgrounds that like Harvard because it would be more in your advantage to not acknowledge any of that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, we have to we have to do these these admissions interviews and it's like I am sure that interviewers are looking for certain things you know and so if you're able to embody those things that catches their eye I mean you know yeah it's all rigged it's all rigged what do you invest in versus what are you cheap about um what do I invest in I invest I do invest a lot of money still in aesthetics so I do get my hair done a lot how much Um, does that cost so hair I probably spend a month like two hundred dollars is that a lot? I feel like that's not... So I've never dyed my hair in my life, so I've never had any expensive hair treatment, and I don't know... I, yeah. I have a lot of friends who spend, like, 300 bucks a month getting, like, all kinds of treatment. Yeah, no, but now that I do braids, it's only a, about $200. When I was having, like, straight styles, that could get to, like, $300 a month. Um, and then I get a lot of facials. Um nice. That's so that's like $120, like twice a month. So it's like $250. Like, and maybe more than that if I'm adding in tip and stuff. And then um, what else do I invest in? That's it's really just aesthetic stuff. I'm not I'm not super into the designer stuff anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm not buying clothes and all of that stuff. I have a rent the runway subscription. So nice. That has cut down on a lot. And also just like clutter. Like I can't have all that stuff that, you know, in your home. Um, what am I cheap about now? Um, I live in a very cheap place. Um, so I my expenses, my cost of living expenses are very, very low. I'm very comfortable with where I live, but it does matter to me to keep that stuff very, very low so that I can have flexibility. Yeah, I'm like very much afraid to get on the hamster wheel of a lot of aesthetic treatments like I used to get my nails done and I would Mm. get like gels yeah that hamster wheel once you're on it like yeah oh my god there was a time in my life that I was spending like 80 bucks every two weeks on my nails yeah oh my god it's a total yeah it is and I also think that like being on camera so much exacerbates it that's true because you know, people, you you see yourself, and then you see the the screenshots, and the and it's like, oh, I can just put a little tweak, and then and then you're addicted. That's why I feel like there are so many things that I'm like, if I start doing it, like especially like skin treatments, yeah. that that'll never end for me. Yeah. Like I know it will never end. I will just now be a person that does that every month. Yeah. So I'm just sort of delaying it, which honestly makes it worse. But you mm-hmm. know. But I have decided this. I've never. I mentioned I never dyed my hair, but I have decided as, as soon as I go gray, I'm gonna just start doing all kinds of wild stuff. Yeah, yeah. I I have a couple of gray hairs now, and I'm like, 
if it gets more like I'm gonna dye my hair red or blonde or like yeah lean into it I really yeah. want to do my dream is to do like once I start going gray and redheads go gray very early apparently so hopefully this is just around the corner because I'm looking forward to it but I love when they do the when women have the dark hair with like one big gray streak. Oh or yeah, white streak. like Stacy from what? Stacy London. Yeah, yes. I love that look. <laughs> I'm excited to experiment one day, but it's so expensive. Anyway, <laughs> what has been your best investment and why? My best investment. Hmm. I mean, my biggest debt is again my college education, and that has paid enormous dividends. Um, yeah, it's a lot of debt to go into early on, but going to Harvard and majoring in what I majored, majored in, it changed. Which is what? Uh, African American studies. It changed the trajectory of my life. There would be no Fort Harriet if not for that. I, originally, I wanted to be a political consultant. Um, I met my best friends. Um, I've been able to tap into networks and really really some I've been in some situations and it's been amazing to be able to tap into those networks so it's a lot of money I learned so much and I don't regret it I don't regret well I've I've maybe regret some of those loans because you know you take more loans than you need because you want to get some money back so maybe I wouldn't do, do that again um that was a wonderful investment and I also think that like what I've spent on like the camera stuff when I first decided I was going to start making videos I was like okay let's get a good camera let's get the good lens and get the lights and stuff and that has paid off I don't know it's, it's been crazy like the the growth of the YouTube channel and what just making videos has done <laughs> I feel like we're cursed yeah it's a literal helicopter what has been your biggest money mistake and why when I was younger, I bought a Lexus when I was like 25. Damn, you really were going all out. Wow. <laughs> um, That, and then I totaled it. Um, <laughs> oh my God. That was not the best decision. Um, was it leased or owned or what? Owned, I owned it. It was new or no? No, it wasn't new, but it was still, it was still too. Oh my God. Expensive. Um, what? And so, yeah, just like too much stunting, too much like flashy, um, just, you know, living like there was no tomorrow. We didn't, I didn't need to do that. I think that, you know, now again, the name of the game is balance there. I'm always going to have like a flashy part of me. It's just there. It's in my soul. But now I recognize that like we've got to have we've got to have balance. I have to think about in the next five years, ten years, twenty years, but also having money to be able to reinvest in the business. Um, so the car, the designer stuff that I don't like anymore. Um, just just spending money on just dumb dumb stuff, upgrades on flights. You know, like first class flight. <laughs> it's like it's just like stupid stuff. Like <laughs> uh, I've gotten dragged on Twitter before for this, but I'm gonna. Be, I'm just gonna say it. I have never once in my life regretted an upgrade. I I fly so much, and the the experience of flying in business versus flying in coach. I'm not gonna pretend like I can afford to upgrade all the time, but on the occasions I have, oh man, it's so worth it to me. It it depends. So there's some routes where it makes perfect sense to upgrade, but there are other routes where it's like this flight was 50 minutes. Oh yeah, I'm not doing yeah, that. Yeah, like upgrading for, you know, like I've done that. Okay, don't do that. Well, <laughs> let me tell you though, if you're doing a cross country red eye and you have yeah. to work the next day, that that like lay down situation comes in. Here. Yeah. But the rest of it, no. What is your biggest current money insecurity? I need to have more money in my savings accounts. I really, I am totally okay of reinvesting in myself and making a lot of money and reinvesting it and spending it and, oh, this will make a good video. Or you want to make sure that your assistant is paid well and that they're happy and all of that stuff and or bringing more um, people who help me do research and that sort of stuff. But sometimes I worry that like, and in adding all of these expenses, I want to make sure that, like, I am not shortchanging myself on the back end. Mm -hmm. 
And so I'm thinking about like, how much money should I have on my savings account? Like, am I, you know, and then like you said, we get all of these, these um, articles about when you're 30, you should have this much saved and you should, your IRA should be worth this much. And I'm like, it's, I don't have that. And it's like, you don't have an IRA. I have an IRA, but okay. it's not at the level that like right. it's supposed to be at. Do you have an emergency fund? Yeah. In your savings account? Yeah. Could it cover three months of your living expenses? Yes. That's huge. But I, is it a, I think that for the amount of money that I am bringing in a month at this point, sometimes I'm worried, worry about like, this is how people go broke. Like they think you're like, I'm reinvesting in myself. I'm reinvesting in myself. Like, is this how people go broke? Or is it how people get rich? I don't know. I'm not sure. And that's, I feel, I don't know. Like, I don't think I have the best money financial instincts. So sometimes I second guess like what my desires are. What has been the financial habit that has helped you the most? Okay, so this is, I feel like this might contradict what I just said, but I will say it has helped me to not be afraid to spend on things that really are related to the mm -hmm. business, yep. that really are related to growing. So when I decided at the end of last year that I needed to get a, an assistant, I, you know, looked it up and I was like, oh, like, oh. I, I could just save that money and just try to do it myself and send the, my own invoices and schedule my own stuff. But then I was just like, I could technically, I could technically save that money, but it would, things will be done sloppily. Things will be done late. I'm trying to set up interviews with people. They're going to think you're unprofessional because you're not returning the emails on time or you're getting distracted by this and by that. And so really being willing to say, no, 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 just spend the money, bring somebody else on. Um, and, and she's better at doing that stuff than I am. Okay. Yeah. So bring people in who can, um, can make up for your deficits and who can make up for your weak spots. And so I'm not afraid to say, I'm just not good at this. Um, and so that has really, really helped me and like, maintaining my sanity but also again my work-life balance I really do care about I'm not working I'm not I didn't do this to work 12 hours a day and as a last question what does the word successful quote-unquote mean to you and when did you first feel successful I think success is when you have enough money to cover all of your living expenses and you can also do extra stuff you know, so I don't have to worry about, I don't know, going to Starbucks or buying a, a dress or whatever, or um, I don't have to worry about doing that stuff. Like that makes me feel successful. It's not about um, living like Kim Kardashian or Kylie Jenner. It's really just about that. And also about having the flexibility to make my own schedule. Um, to say, oh, I don't want to, I don't want to work today, or to say today I'm only going to work for from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. Like for me, freedom is my most valuable asset. Um, I always said that if I wanted to like have deadlines and like all that stuff, like I would be working at McKinsey right now, or I would work at Goldman. Like you know, like I know a lot of people who work at those places. No shade. I should say no shade to people who work corporate um shout out to you but it is not for me and I've always known that working in a corporate environment is not for me and so my dream has been since I was a kid to own your own thing and set your own schedule and so now that I have the freedom to not only set my own schedule but also like do extra fun stuff like that feels like success to me. There are so many people who hate their jobs, mm. who don't like what they do, who have to work 12 hours a day. And I feel so incredibly privileged to be able to live this life, to be free, to have mobility, but to also be deeply fulfilled by the work that I do. So I feel successful. Um, and I feel like I really hit that stride last year. Cheers to that. Ooh. Well, thank you so much for being here, Kim. Thank you for having me. What a nice time it has been. Where can people go to see more of this 
wonderful thing you got going on. All right, so um, you can hit up the For Harriet YouTube channel. Just, you know, search For Harriet in, on YouTube. Um, you can find me at Kimberly N. Foster on Instagram and Twitter. I'm really trying to give up social media, but sometimes I'm over there. Um, you know, you can catch me uh, tweeting and deleting. Um, and, for, and For Harriet also has an Instagram account. It's for Harriet. Well, thank you so much for being here. And thank you guys, as always, for watching. Bye. Bye. So one thing that you're always going to want to do if you are looking to get a hold on your money in a more long-term holistic way is to get that real bird's eye view on your finances. And that's gonna mean the higher level stuff like your net worth, your debt to income ratio, your credit worthiness, your credit utilization ratio, all of the numbers that are really going to impact you for those bigger financial decisions. Like for example, if you're ever going to apply for a loan. And that is where an app like Turbo, which is completely free by the way, comes in because it gives you all of those tools to have a really high level understanding of your finances the way for example a lender is going to look at them eventually we're all probably going to be making these bigger financial decisions as we move through our young adult lives or even hey i'm not going to be ageist here our adult adult lives and it's important that you go into these decisions knowing exactly where you stand and for example if you are planning on making a big financial move a year out and you look at your credit status and you're like who maybe my credit utilization rate ratio is a little bit too high. That's something I want to work on to work up my score over the next, you know, nine, 10 months or what have you. Like those are the kind of decisions that you can make when you have that information. So I highly recommend you check out Turbo at the link in our description or the show notes so you can start to get that kind of level of understanding on your own finances and be totally prepared when you go to those big decision moments. Mm -hmm.